We are continuing this week our series on the book of Ruth, and our scripture will come from chapter 4. Then went Boaz up to the gate, and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city, and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants, before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it, beside thee and I am after thee and he said I will redeem it then said Boaz what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess the wife of the dead to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance and the kinsman said I cannot redeem it for myself lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. God's word for his people. Thanks be to God. Now in last week's sermon, we talked about the courtship between Boaz and Ruth and how Boaz had shown great favor and grace to Ruth as she gleaned in his field to the point that Naomi began to take notice. And she understood that Boaz was a kinsman of their family. And she understood that Boaz could provide for Ruth and for her. And that he could redeem their family's land. And so Naomi uh, prepared Ruth for an encounter at midnight. And we talked about how Ruth would go and follow all of Naomi's instructions. And she would find out where Boaz was, where he was threshing the, the, the barley. And when he had eaten and drunk and laid down to rest, she would uncover his feet, which was a customary thing back then. And she would lay over his feet. And when he would take notice, she would tell him that she is Ruth the Moabitess. And she would ask him, she would go a step further and specifically ask Boaz to take his skirt and to cover her with it, which was a symbol of her saying, I want to become your wife and I want you to redeem me and my family. And Boaz was excited about it. But he said, I will do this. But there's one thing I got to do first because there is someone closer to you than me that's part of our family. And basically, he's got first dibs, first refusal, as you like to say sometimes. You ever had your eye on something and maybe you weren't quite ready right then, but if you told the person, if you ever get ready to sell it, give me first refusal. Okay, well, there was a kinsman. In Naomi and Ruth's family, a brother of Elimelech that had first refusal. And Boaz, being a good and righteous person, was not going to undercut him. He was going to go and do the right thing and offer the land and Ruth to the relative first. And so that's kind of where our story picks up this morning. Uh, Just a few things, though, just to kind of set the tone. We've, We've hinted around it. We've kind of talked it. I've thrown the terms out there. But this... This lesson today, this message today, is all about the kinsman redeemer, which is one of the major themes of this book. And um, I'm not going to read all the passages that relate to you. Uh, You may go back at some time if you choose to. Uh, But the law of the kinsman redeemer is given to us in the book of Leviticus. And the law of the what was called the liberate marriage, which is what 
you know, would, would, would be here concerning Boaz and Ruth is found in Deuteronomy 25. Now, without getting into too much detail, um, just the overall purpose of these laws was to preserve the name and protect the property of the families in Israel. You see, God owned all the land, and they understood that. God owned the land, and he did not want the land to be exploited by the rich people who would take advantage of the poor and the widows and the like. All right? We understand that, how, how that can happen. You know how sometimes those with more money, uh, all they want to do is get more and more and more and more. There's greed, and sometimes the, 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 these rich Greedy people would exploit the land. You know, nothing new under the sun. It happens today. It happened back then. And so in the, in the law, God put safeguards for this so that a poor widow could have herself and her family's land redeemed. Now, um, of course, the problem is not everybody obeyed this. Not everybody did what was right. And eventually, this sort of thing, along with idolatry and, and all sorts of other sins, would lead Israel into captivity. But God had put these laws in there for a purpose. When obeyed, these laws made sure that a dead man's family did not, that his name did not die with him, and that his property would not be sold outside of the family or the tribe, that it w would remain with the family that God intended it to be. So that was the purpose of the kinsman redeemer laws. Now, in, in practicality, this is basically the way it worked. Okay, if a, if a woman's husband died, it was the responsibility of the closest male relative that was of age to marry her to take that land and possess it and work it, make it fruitful. And in essence, he would be taking care of his brother's wife and would take her into his home as his own. And therefore, she would be redeemed, the land would be redeemed, and the, the uh, name of the deceased would be redeemed. Now, I know it sounds kind of foreign to us, all right? Some of you might be thinking about your brother-in-laws and, you know, your cousins and that sort of thing, but this was the custom of the time, and there was a reason for it. So Boaz, now it just so happened that Boaz was in, not only was he a close kinsman, but he was also an eligible bachelor, and he found favor with Ruth, and he found, you know, he, he showed grace to Ruth, and he was attracted to Ruth. And so it all began to work out. But first, he had to offer it to the closest of kin, which was this somebody that just happened to be in the town. Now, I've always kind of found this, this interesting. When Boaz offered, he, you know, and he did everything right. He grabbed the guy, and here's God's providence again. You know, Boaz went to the gate, and the guy happened to be walking by. So he grabs the guy, sits him down, and then he gets ten witnesses from the elders of Bethlehem to sit with them. Because in, in the custom, you know, you had to have witnesses to make sure anything, any deal went down properly. You know, and we, we do it, a lot of times we do it with signatures now. But back then you had to have witnesses that may testify if something ever went wrong. So Boaz was doing everything right. And he tells this kinsman, he says... Our brother Elimelech is dead. His widow and his widow's daughter-in-law are there, and they, you know, there needs to be redeeming. I'm offering his land to you for you to go and purchase it and redeem it. And the guy's like, oh, okay, some more land. Yeah, I'll take it. And then Boaz says, but now when you buy that land, you also got to take Ruth. And I don't know what was going on in his family or what exactly he was worried about. It says something about he's worried about it messing up his own inheritance. But when Ruth comes into the equation, he says, I can't do that. I always wonder, did he have a, a wife at home that he was <laughs> thinking about seeing how that would play out once everybody got back to the household? I don't know. But he was going to buy the land. But then when Ruth became part of the package, he said, can't do it. 
He says, Boaz, so you're next. You go ahead and do it. And so Boaz, with the ten witnesses gathered around, he, he goes forward with this transaction. And there's a custom about, you know, if, when a deal is made that you take off the, the sandal and you, you hand it to the person you're making a deal with. The sandal represented what you walk on the land with, and therefore that sandal represented the land. You were transferring land, property, and rights to that person when you took off your sandal and handed it to them, and everybody was witness to it. And so the deal went down, and Boaz had the opportunity to not only redeem and purchase Elimelech's land, the, the dead man who, who died in the country of Moab. Remember, his sons died as well, so they were not there to inherit it, but he also made it known that he planned to take Ruth as his wife, which is what Naomi had been dreaming for this whole time ever since he realized that Boaz kind of liked Ruth, kind of was taking care of her in the field. And the people of Israel come out and they are just so happy and they say, we hope that this woman that you have taken is like Leah and Rachel who are like the mothers of Israel and that she is fruitful and that she would, she would give you children upon children and that y'all are just blessed. And so it was a happy occasion. And next week, as we begin to wrap this up, we're going to talk about the, the, the wedding and the children and, and, and God's providence and tie it all together. But for now, for now, Boaz, understand that Boaz was fulfilling his rightful obligation and responsibility as a kinsman redeemer. Now, we know he could refuse it. The other man did. But Boaz didn't. He wanted to. And they were blessed because of it. Now, as we consider this whole stuff about the kinsman redeemer and we look at the actions of Boaz and how generous and gracious he was. I mean, a very wealthy man in a small community probably had many options, but it was Ruth, the foreigner, and Naomi, the poor widow, that he chose to redeem. Now, we need to understand that when we talk about redemption, that, that, is a, that is an important word for us as Christians. And unfortunately, in so many people's mind, it doesn't get much further than a coupon. I'm redeeming the coupon. All right. But I want you to kind of go back into, into a day far before our day when, when, when people were purchased and, and there was slavery and there were, you know, women didn't have the rights that they do today and they were almost seen more as property and, you know, things like that. Um, redemption was a much bigger and broader and deeper term than simply redeeming a coupon. Redemption meant setting free by paying a price. Setting free by paying a price. And in the case of Naomi and Ruth, they were in sort of a bondage as they came back from Moab. All right? They were bound to a life of poverty and relying on the handouts of others, uh, somewhat disgraced, even though none of it was their fault. That was their plight in society. Their husband's name was in jeopardy of being lost forever. Their family losing its land forever. But here comes Boaz, steps in, and redeems them, sets them free from this bondage of, of widowhood, and he does it by paying a price for them. So it is a great illustration of redemption. He takes them from poverty and weakness and, and just a, a life of misery and restores them to a life of joy. Even to the point where Ruth would have children and Naomi would have grandchildren. And I don't want to give away any more, but God would truly, truly bless them. Through the actions of Boaz. So that is what redemption means. And that is how it's illustrated in this beautiful story. I want to talk just a little bit about the Redeemer himself though. All right. According to the law, remember that the Redeemer had to be a near kinsman. And although we're not exactly sure how Boaz was related. Because even though it says our brother Elimelech. That could have just been a term. 
You know, like sometimes I'll say Brother James or Brother Tony. All right, but he was somehow related. So he was able because he was a near kinsman. He was also able because he could afford to pay the price. Boaz, whatever the price was, we're not sure, but whatever it was, Boaz had the means to do it. See, he was able to redeem because he was a near kinsman. He was able to redeem because he could afford to pay the price. He had the resources to do it. But he was also able to redeem because he was willing to do it. So if you look at the three requirements that were necessary for a redeemer, they had to be a near kinsman. They had to be able, in other words, have the resources, but they also had to be willing. And Boaz was more than willing. And we look at the method here, which I've already described in certain terms, the method of redemption, the transaction that took place, the, the cost was paid, the deal was done, and it was done before witnesses. Boaz specifically asked for ten witnesses to be there so that they could understand the transaction and be able to testify that this is what took place. Now I say this because, and I remember I said redemption is such an important word for Christians. What is this story? What is redemption? What does the kinsman redeemer have to do with us? All right, does anybody remember the first hymn today? Don't look in your bulletin. That was the second one. Blessed Redeemer. Redemption. Redemption is setting free by paying a price. Why is redemption such an important word for the Christian? What is it that we need to be redeemed from? Why should we as human beings feel the need to be redeemed? We don't live in a culture, in a time where, you know, we have slavery. I would know it does exist in our world and, you know, human trafficking and that sort of thing. But none of us right here have experienced the bondage of slavery in, in, in the sense that we think of. What is it we need to be redeemed from? Why do we need a redeemer? What bondage are we in? Well, the Bible makes it clear that we are all in bondage to sin. We all are in bondage to the weaknesses and the appetites of the flesh. We all are in bondage to temptation. And we all mess up. For lack of a better term, we all just mess up. And we hurt. And we judge. And we're selfish sometimes. And we're greedy sometimes. And we do really stupid things sometimes. And we just can't help ourselves sometimes. And we are therefore in bondage. And some are in bondage to far greater things. Prayer was offered this morning for the bondage of addiction and drugs. But that's not the only thing that people can be in bondage to. People can be in bondage to uh, sexual immorality. People can be in bondage to gambling. People can be in bondage to alcohol and so many other things. People can be addicted to and bondage to things that at first seem so simple like television and that sort of thing. But they can go so haywire and, and consume you. People can be in bondage to work. But if we're not careful, our whole life can be left in bondage. But then comes the Redeemer to set us free. Jesus Christ. Does he have the marks of a Redeemer as did Boaz? Is Jesus a near kinsman? Did Jesus not become a near kinsman so that he could set us free? Did he not become flesh and blood so that he could die for us on the cross? And the Bible says that he's not ashamed to call us brothers. Is Jesus able 
to redeem? Does he have the resources? Is Jesus not God Almighty in the flesh? Did Jesus not live a sinless life? If the, if the law called for, for sheep and, and other animals that were perfect and without blemish to be sacrificed for the atonement of sins, if Jesus not the perfect sacrifice with all the resources of heaven available to redeem? And as Boaz was willing to redeem, is Jesus not motivated out of love to redeem us who are in bondage to sin? The Bible says in 1 John, He loved us. Not that we loved Him, but He loved us and died for us. Saved us. Redeemed us. Boaz did his transaction of redemption in front of the witnesses of Bethlehem. By two, the Bible says by two or three witnesses. Basically is a deal made right. Jesus. Although there were witnesses there at the cross. And there were witnesses who testified to his resurrection. Do we not also have the witness of the word and the spirit that continue to speak to us today? Is Jesus not truly our blessed kinsman redeemer? I've got a short story I want to tell you. That perhaps will help us understand this even a little bit more. There was a young boy named Tom. Who had just made a new boat. Just a little toy sailboat. He took it to the edge of the river. He had a string attached to it. Kind of mooring it to himself and to the shoreline. And as he took it to the stream and he walked it. The boat began to smoothly sail down the the creek. Tom sat down, just letting more and more of the string go. The sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. And he just absolutely fell in love with this boat that he had created. Suddenly, a strong current comes along. It catches the boat. Tom begins to try to pull it back to shore, but the string breaks. And the little boat just goes racing down the stream. Tom would run as fast as he can along the shore to try to find it. But soon the boat would slip out of sight. After all afternoon looking for it, he finally kind of gave up and went back home. Sad. Upset. But he couldn't find it. A few days later, he was walking home from school. He walked past a second-hand store and noticed something that looked like a boat in the window. He got closer and closer, and he realized, sure enough, it was his boat, the one he had made with his own hands. He went into the store and talked to the owner and said, sir, that's my boat. I made it. The store owner looked at him and said, sorry, son. Someone else brought it in this morning. If you want it, you'll have to buy it for a dollar. Tom was a little upset, but he had to have that boat. He ran back to his house. He dumped out his piggy bank. He counted out all of his change, and it came up to exactly a dollar. He runs back to the store, goes up to the counter, and says, here's my money for the boat. The man handed it to him. He hugged on his boat. He ran back to the shore and began to sell it again. And as he's doing it, and as he's just having a ball that afternoon, he looks at the boat and says, Boat, you're twice mine. First I made you, and now I have bought you. He redeemed His boat, his own creation, yet it had to be redeemed. 
Is that not what God has done for us? He made us. We messed up. We're in bondage. But Jesus paid it all to redeem us and to give us life. Colossians 1 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from darkness, And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption. Through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus. Our redeemer. Now I pray this morning. That you and I would both begin to reflect. On our walk with God. And if you're here this morning and you've never really understood that you can be redeemed, that all your past faults and sins and mistakes can be forgiven, that someone who has all the power in the universe and beyond has loved you enough to pay it all for your redemption, for my redemption, for your redemption. If you've never understood that, but today the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart, I pray that you would get on your knees and you would just give it to God and allow him to deliver you, because he will. But perhaps there's also one in here today that although you do know Christ, something's been going on in your life where you're feeling in bondage, because we still struggle. Even after we come to the cross, we still struggle, and God knows that. Perhaps there's someone, somebody, or something in your life, and you're feeling bondage from that. You've been made aware of of a feeling of captivity. Give it to God. Because the Bible says, if Jesus makes you free, you are free indeed. And as you think about these things this morning, pray that you would join me in singing Our hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and the altar is open for anybody that wishes to come forth.